today's customer data summit uh, is actually the first of three summits that we planned across Southeast Asia, uh, Middle East and India regions. Uh, we have a very, very exciting session planned today. Uh, we actually put together this event uh, focused on data-driven uh, marketing, mainly because we are seeing a very strong trend in the Asia region among marketeers uh, who are starting to understand and leverage the power of their customer data. I think it's also fair to say that as we slowly heal from the scars of COVID-19, uh, being data and digital savvy is no longer a trend, but almost a survival mandate. And so the speakers today represent some of the sharpest minds in the region who are at the forefront of this trend uh, and are experts at harnessing data to transform this uh, their businesses. Uh, as a digital marketing enthusiast, I, I'm really, really looking forward to it. I hope you will enjoy it too. Uh, just to give you a sense of the sequence of events uh, that we'll have today, and then we'll just get started with the first one. Um, we will kick off today's summit uh, with a panel session titled The Rise of the Super Intelligent Marketer. Uh, Eugene Quek, Director, Global Digital Marketing at AIA. Ram Lakshmi Narayanan, Partner at KPMG. Gaurav Gupta, Director, Marketing Operations at the Property Guru Group. Uh, we'll talk about uh, modern marketing ideas and principles and give you some terrific insights on how to extract and leverage data to drive business outcomes. I will introduce each of them ahead of the panel session in more detail in just a few minutes from now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when we conceived this event, we wanted to bring you not just insights on data-driven marketing, but also a detail-oriented perspective from the battle trenches. So right after the panel, in a session titled Notes from the Martic Battlefront, we will have Michael Justin Devera, uh, Head of Digital Marketing at Film Life Philippines, do exactly that. Miko's detail-oriented planning and his ability to articulate his thought process clearly will make this another great session uh, as he talks through best practices and pitfalls while implementing a customer data platform. The last session of, for this evening will feature a fireside chat with Prashant Agarwal, Group Head of Digital Marketing at AIA. Now, when we speak of MarTech today, uh, we really mean a big picture convergence of marketing, technology, and management. The management and leadership element of MarTech is just as critical uh, as marketing and technology. Prashant is an extraordinary leader who's at the forefront of a massive digital transformation, and he brings both clarity and acumen into what it means to drive change across the organization, right? So there you have it. Those are the sessions that we have planned for you today. It's going to be super exciting. Uh, we expect to be on time, so we don't expect delays beyond uh, a few minutes here and there as the sessions, uh, you know, uh, extend a little bit here and there. So yeah, uh, we'll get started right off the bat. Uh, grab your popcorn and uh, stay glued to the sessions, yeah? <clears throat> So uh, that said, let's start off with our first event for the day. Uh, now, succeeding with modern marketing uh, requires a combination of out-of-the-box thinking, uh, creativity, and a strong analytical bent of mind. Uh, our panelists today uh, are eminent industry leaders uh, who have demonstrated all of these skills many times over uh, in their career. Uh, let me introduce them to you without further ado. Uh, our first speaker for today is Eugene Quek. Eugene, Eugene is an award-winning marketeer with more than 20 plus years experience in financial services. Currently, he's AIA's director, global digital marketing. And before that, he was HSBC's global head of marketing, international services, and Singapore country head of marketing. He has also held several senior regional marketing roles at Citibank, UBS, and ANZ, bringing rich marketing experiences and many digital firsts to the financial industry. Uh, welcome, Eugene. Uh, <clears throat> our second panelist for today is Ram Lakshmi Narayanan. Ram is a partner at KPMG Singapore. Uh, he has over 30 years of deep industry experience, both in banking and insurance. He has led several award-winning sales, marketing, and services digital transformation engagements across multiple Asian markets, including India, China, Malaysia, and Singapore. Uh, and this also includes launching Singapore's first end-to-end -end digital commerce platform, for a top tier composite insurer, which was awarded the best financial services e-commerce platform at the Asia Marketing Awards 2018. Ram's uh, deep MarTech expertise, especially uh, in cutting edge technologies like customer data platforms, uh, may make him an incredibly valuable and insightful speaker for today. So that's Ram. And we round off today's uh, elite panel um, with Gaurav Gupta, uh, is he in? I'm not sure if Gigi is in already. I hope he is in. <laughs> he was running a few minutes late. Uh, <clears throat> Gaurav Gupta, or Gigi, uh, as he goes by, uh, is the Director of Marketing Operations at uh, Property Guru Group. Um, 
So, oh yeah, see, Gigi is in already. Wonderful. Uh, prior to this, he led the omni-channel marketing practice at Circles, uh, promising to engage users with smarter messaging at most opportune moments. His 16 plus years of industry experience comprises performance marketing at leading global media agencies combined with in-house business experience. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, he loves exchanging ideas on marketing innovations. And know, knowing Gigi, if you ask Gigi what's his secret sauce for being successful in digital marketing, his response is going to be to always question what people say is the norm. Uh, the industry is far too nascent to conform to any, he would say. Uh, welcome to you, Gigi. Uh, welcome, Eugene. Uh, welcome, Ram. A very warm welcome to the panel titled Rise of Good to be here, Mr. Um, Graf. Thank you so much for inviting me. Wonderful. So uh, let me start by asking uh, you gentlemen a very foundational question, right? Uh, what stands out in modern marketing is really the ability to effectively collect uh, organize and then use customer data, right? So I, I would love to uh, sort of hear from each of you, uh, you know, in terms of what kind of insights uh, do you try to extract and leverage from customer data in the context of your business? And and how do you sort of use this uh, to drive business outcomes? Uh, Eugene, I would love for you to sort of go first here. Yeah, th thanks, Subra. So, so the interesting piece is that the consumer journey has really changed quite a fair bit. Um, I mean, 10 years ago, um, digital marketing or digital footprints were, were invisible and people didn't know what digital marketing was. And, and to this date, uh, organizations still struggle with the transformation of digital. Um, so what digital marketers particularly look for are the signals that uh, we can get nowadays. Now, it, it, it gets harder and harder as we move into the future, as privacy laws become more strict. But the reality is consumer behavior is not going to go anywhere different. Um, the COVID has taught us today that people are using digital more and more uh, to buy their things, including groceries, um, uh, and to pay for items that, that they never once knew of. And it's no longer the domain of the young. It's now even the elderly that are taking on uh, using QR codes, using digital signals. Uh, as an organization, I'm looking for those signals to be able to personalize things for my consumer so that they will eventually be given the right products at the right time uh, at the right price so that they will be then given that product and they are meeting their needs. So ultimately, uh, organizations are changing because the consumers are changing. And what we're all trying to look for in this wonderful uh, digital marketing world uh, are the signals. And, and there are so many of them, and I'm glad that uh, Lemonis is working with us uh, to get that actually uh, crystal clear for us. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Eugene. So I think we speak of signals uh, here, so I would love to bring in uh, Gigi here. Uh, Gigi, I think I would love to hear from you as well. You know, what are these signals that you look for as well? Anything else that you want to chime in with here? So no, I, I actually concur with Eugene there, and uh, my approach has always been begin with the customer <clears throat> um, you know customer centricity and customer obsession may be something that's been doing the news buyers uh, for a couple of years but come to think of it the business was always centered around the customer it's just that uh, baby our greed took us away uh, and started optimizing towards our uh, costs and uh, towards the bottom line now um, I think the signals that I look after, uh, look out for has to start with customer. What is he looking for? And how am I going to add value? If I am unable to create a win-win situation, then I may be able to win that customer for a short term. But as soon as my secret is out or my skeletons are out, the customer is not going to remain with me anymore, no matter how good my retention strategy or my, my life cycle marketing is. So it all boils down to the philosophy first that your product and your marketing services have to find the right fit with your customers but considering but let's keep let's let's keep that aside and take that for granted that that's that's something which we've already have resolved for then comes what are those signals uh, which is going to help us identify the right customer to be able to offer and create that win-win sort of a um, uh, bond and those signals are essentially and you know not, not so surprisingly are driven by the customer behavior himself. You'll be driving 
tens of thousands of people um, every day onto your website, but the only few will stick around. That very behavior is a de- is is an is it uh, is a testament to who uh, who you should be going after. You know there is this fallacy in this uh, in our trade that only uh, less than two percent of uh, people who come to our website actually convert. And I'm talking from point of view of uh, if I'm wearing an e-commerce hat. Um, there is a reason for it, and the reason is that people we are attracting a lot of people who are not even relevant to be buying that product. So it's not a function of uh, how bad the website is or how, how bad the product is. It's a function of how bad is our targeting and is our ability to bring the right people in. And that is what we have to all together have to work towards. You see, uh, the changing uh, privacy laws and the, and the uh, privacy sensibilities of people as well as the industry and the trade is, uh, is not going to help this, this cause. And therefore, I, I, I speak about contextual marketing will do the times again. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a sort of, you know, will be brought back. And this contextual marketing could be more intelligent. And this has to be informed with those signals that we were just so talking about. The customer behavior on your apps as well as on your, on your website has to be married with contextualization or contextual, um, let's say, uh, targeting strategies. To be able to offer people the right proposition at the right time, and to Eugene's point, to the, at the right uh, price point. So, Absolutely. yeah, my 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 take is those signals are very important, but they have to find a contextual relevance and then offered uh, to to the people. Got it. Got it. No, thanks, Gigi. And uh, so, Ram, let me just sort of uh, ask you there. Therefore, Eugene spoke of. Uh, sort of capturing the right signals um, and sort of GG said, okay, that's that's of course uh, important and you also need to sort of marry that with contextualization uh, and sort of produce relevant experiences. Just sort of uh, if you could chime in with your thoughts here as well, especially in the context of um, one of the things that GG said, which is if you target right uh, and if you get the right kind of sort of audience uh, to your properties, then you will naturally see better engagement in conversions. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, bro, and uh, and lovely to be here, join, you know, joining you guys. So thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, I think Eugene and uh, uh, Gaurav, you said GG. We have a we have a different meaning for the word GG in Singapore, so I wouldn't use GG. <laughs> Eugene's laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. But you know, <laughs> Eugene and Gaurav are spot on about you know the the need to understand the signals. If I can take a step back and think about, you know, what's changed because um, a business of serving clients has never changed for any organization. Um, products are the way our clients experience our products, you know, are, and, and that's very important. It's, it's, it's in, in, in the end of the day, you know, our product determine who we are to our clients. And, 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 and marketing's role has always been around ensuring that you present it in the right way to the client in order for them to, 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 to experience that. I think what's changed then, what's changed for us is around the fact that uh, consumers have gone digital. Consumers have gone virtual, and and what, has, what do we mean by that? Is because the way they can experience your product, um, in terms of how they get it, has, has gone digital, and that's gone significantly digital. And there's an acceleration towards that, and and there's a greater recognition of the fact that people uh, will therefore are looking for a better connect with that product or that experience that you're trying to bring to them and how they relate to that. And this is, I think, a fundamental shift that started to happen. And that's the, the, the fundamental reason why we go look for the, you know, the signals. You know, what am I doing? You know, because today when, when your consumer has gone virtual, um, you're not face to face. When you're not face to face, you look for some way to connect, some way to understand what they're trying to do and relate your products and your services to them and manifest it in the way they would like to, 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 to use it. That's going to continue to evolve, um, and that's where I think um, uh, signals become very, very critical. Now, every piece of data that you get access to in your organization tells your story. And there's, that's a, a very significant um, uh, a shift that has started to happen. For the longest of the time, um, marketing's focus was significantly around brands and products, but now they started to realize we need to understand what our consumers are doing about our products and why do they even buy our products? How do I then be relevant in the context of what they're buying, which is what 
Dara talked about. If you can't context it, you're going to miss the equation. And that and 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 data was 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 is the fundamental element to, to getting there, right? And and as I said, data tells your story. And that story, if you stitch it together, then gives you a, a way to then connect to your customers and in 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 and, and and respond to them. And again, if if I can bring in another angle to this, um, for the last large part of what we have seen so far, there was there was a fundamental divide between sales and marketing, if I can put it in that way, right? Sales was sales, you know, we go and sell. Marketing continued to be very relevant from positioning perspective. That positioning now has changed dr dr uh, dramatically, and how that's changed. You now need to be relevant to that customer until the time the customer is actually going to consume your product or your service. What it means is that you now in marketing need to start to drive through to the last mile. It's just not enough to present the product in the right way, position the brand in the right way. Now you need is you know context it for the product uh, consumer and be there alongside your sales organization to be able to then ensure that that consumption happens. But that's again because of the real time nature in which we're trying to deal with things. So you go online, you look for a product, you're not going to spend the next 48 hours or 72 hours looking for a product, depending on what product you're buying. But by and large, people go on, and most of the studies will tell you that when you get onto a, a platform, you want to buy something and you go online when you're looking for something. You go, you buy, you, that's the experience. That's when the rubber hits the road. You want to be able to get that customer. You want to be able to get that right context, present it in that right context and get it to them. That's a significant shift for marketing. Data brings that together, signals bring it together, and our ability to pull it together and, and present it and in, in, in using it in the right way gets you that outcome that you're looking for. And in that context is where we are now starting to see MarTech platforms and others now morphing more and more towards you know, understanding that customer data, but from a marketer's perspective. Fantastic. So I think just uh, just if I were to very quickly sort of summarize everybody's responses, I think Eugene, you spoke of getting the right signals, being able to capture that. Uh, Gigi, you added this element of uh, contextualization or personalization, if I dare call uh, call it, uh, adding one more piece of jargon there. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, Ram, what I heard you say is, you know, not just this, but I think two other things is, uh, it's not just about, uh, the, the contextualization also has to evolve uh, during the buying journey, uh, sort of to continuously reflect uh, what what the customer is probably interested in at that point in time, and potentially even after the transaction is done, I would I would argue, right? So therefore, and I think all three of you really touched upon the notion of uh, using data to create insights, and I would really like to sort of jump into that at the next level now. Uh, Ram, I will stick with you, and I would love to hear your perspective because, and then sort of work my way back. Uh, because I, I do know that, you know, you've had so much experiences with uh, with people and process uh, transformation as well. And I think one of the things I've seen is that successful organizations that are really successful in implementing these kind of uh, transformations, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, actually very people led. Right. So they have been able to decentralize uh, the process of uh, intelligence creation, if I call it that. Right. And it, at some level, you could also talk of things like democratization of data and sort of really putting it in the hands of all people and encouraging them to use this insight. So what what is what is the key to getting this right? Because I think ultimately, if that's uh, if there is a culture of experimentation, if there's a culture of data and insight production, then I think other things sort of fall into place. So what's the key according to you? Uh, if, 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 if have to be brutally honest, I would say that marketing mar marketers have to reimagine their game. Um, you know, you have to uh, get out of your comfort zone and get on to understand data. A lot of the marketers don't understand data. Um, and, and I think that's a big shift that I'm starting to see now. More and more organizations are embedding that skill within their organization. There's a, there's a distinction between using data scientists to come up with, you know, what, you know, some, some analysis and using that to then frame your story. What I think will make a big shift and ma ma the organization that are making that successful shift are embedding that knowledge within that. So today, if, you, if you're if you a marketer, uh, your core skill has got to be that you understand data. You understand how to use the data. You know how to then create the story with the data and be able to leverage it. It's going to become a critical skill um, that you need to think in terms of. And that transition and that transformation from a people perspective is the cornerstone for success. 
uh, from a marketer's perspective to make that work. Uh, for the, 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 the other important change that uh, we, we, we're starting to see, and that again is still in many organizations, a, it remains a big of a challenge, is that data is spread all over the place. You don't have, in most cases, have the luxury. Some of the new age organizations have tackled it right up front, and they are the ones who are now demonstrating to the rest of the world um, that, you know, how data can bring, bring about a difference. But if you go back, there's a lot of those incumbent organizations struggle with that because the data is spread all over the place. That the sheer effort of being able to bring that together has always been the challenge. So, and again, you know, until we saw so the evolution of CDP to where it is today, that was that remained the biggest of the challenge. I think I think that's where I would again now see that the ability to take control of the data, being able to pull all of that together, augmenting that is going to become very significant for them to be successful. And and, and I think those are very important aspects to think about. Um, and don't and I would I would encourage organizations not to go in and do these things if you're not ready for those type of changes, because what then becomes is just an exercise. Um, and you can also go and claim that, hey, by the way, if you've done this, you really have not done it if you've not embedded into your own organization. So uh, that that's what I would I have seen uh, the, the ones that have been a little bit successful and these are the ones who had adopted that quite successful. Got it. I think I think I, sorry, I think you spoke of three things there. First is uh, probably you know a mindset change, and then sort of committing, if I can call it that, committing to the whole initiative, and then uh, take control of the data because that's really the starting point. Eugene, I would love to sort of hear from you here. Um, you know, I, I know that you you're sort of really doing a lot of this on the ground, and sort of uh, you know, I, I, of course, commitment is something that I've seen uh, in Ample uh, at AIA. And so, what is what do you think are uh, sort of uh, the keys from your perspective. So, so data can be seen in many ways and it's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, when we get data, it can be interpreted as positive or negative and you can go down a different strategy or a different route, um, unfortunately, right? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and that's the key to it, right? Being flexible and agile enough to be able to change and test and learn. Uh, many organizations um, are not ready for that. Uh, they are structured in such a way where their, their people are not ready to take on new things or the risk of failure is there. Um, therefore, to them, uh, failure is a, is a taboo. And in Asia, it's, it's a very common thing, right? I will not fail. I will succeed. Uh, and because of that, organizations need to start changing the way we look at uh, tests and learns being able to take on things that they never once thought they could because um, today what we're doing today may be invented tomorrow. Um, the data that comes into us uh, could not, may not work tomorrow. So um, it's a constant flux that people need to get used to um, rather than uh, consistency, which I think in a digital world, it uh, doesn't exist. And, and, and I'd like to bring up to another point here. Um, I, th there's a saying that people we do digital marketing, and I remember 10 years ago, everyone had a digital name in their name card. Organizations were basically making so much money, they did a dot-com behind their name, and suddenly the share price went up by 20, 30 times, right? Uh, the, reali the reality is changing the name and changing, putting it digital does not make us digital. Um, and we do need to understand that there is a structural change that needs to happen all the way through from top to bottom. Uh, leadership has to embrace digital change. Leadership needs to understand the consumer shift that's happening, it's a tidal wave that's not going to go away. Number two, we also need to make sure that we are able to train our people properly. Uh, um, uh, Rob, a very good point. Uh, people are not trained. The digital marketeers believe that doing the same thing over and over again will give us the same result. We have to think outside the box constantly, and that's what digital marketeers love to do. It's about changing the way we see a problem and thinking another way, and if it fails, doesn't matter, pick yourself up and do it again. So that mentality, that, that psychology, that grit is required uh, to be truly successful as opposed to a cosmetic, and that's important. Absolutely. No, I think uh, that that element of training that you touched upon uh, is, is, I fully agree, that's so, so critical. And in fact, maybe on that note, I will ask Gigi to ch chime in here. I know, Gigi, you've really seen so many uh, people come through the ranks here in your teams in the past, right? Um, and I know that you are personally very passionate about digital marketing in general. And so I, I do see you uh, sort of emphasize training a lot. So let me just sort of ask you there, uh, you know, the sort of elements of training that 
that you think are relevant and anything else you would want to add in this context? I think, um, well, I completely agree with uh, what Ram and uh, Eugene have uh, pointed and, and those by, by, by no means uh, are uh, less important, but I believe uh, it needs to start with need. Um, the need of the organization has to define how the top line, how, how the top management is going to behave. Uh, that sometimes is dictated by the vision. If COVID would have not been a reality, do you think 70% uh, of the organizations uh, would have even woken up for towards uh, digital transformation? Um, perhaps not. So do we want to leave it to chance? So it all goes back to vision. And the vision would define their need, and therefore that need should define whether they'll be a top-down diktat. Now, even if there is a top-down diktat, if there is no need at the bottom at the grassroots level, you will not be able to achieve the democratization or the decentralization, which is paramount for uh, this whole habit to sort of seep in. You see, it will not help a company and its uh, and its customer obsessive or customer obsession objective and harness that uh, harness the power of data if it's not actually harnessed at the at the very bottom at the root at the grassroots level of the company so we know it for a fact that it's imperative that it gets decentralized so there's no there's no there's no two points about that coming back to the need of the ground grassroots unless and until they feel connected to be able to deliver either to their KPIs or to their OKRs or just if there's a breed of uh, marketers out there who actually think and are so customer obsessed, that we will not be able to deliver that customer obsess obsessive um, proposition unless and until we, we get in bed with data. That need is not going to be uh, will not create a fire in the belly. So let's assume that they have now woken up to this realization that yes, it's the power of data is going to which is going to see us through to creating new um, um, ideas of reaching our customers. And I'll tell you a very real life example. Just yesterday, I was brainstorming with my with, with my team as to how are we going to achieve our next targets. And uh, somebody said, you know what? Uh, Gigi, there, is, there are only finite amount of ideas out there, um, uh, and you know we would pretty soon will would would have exhausted exhausted all of it, and that actually you know I brought that idea or that that, that point of view home, and I thought to myself that there has to be another um, there has to be another avenue on which you tap into an un, un sort of to to unleash an infinite amount of uh, amount of uh, strategies or, or approaches or processes whatever you call it whatever you may. And that sort of led me to realize that uh, my team may not have the complete realization of the power of what data brings. And power of data is nothing but being able to understand the customer, the signals, segment it, then be able to marry it with the right message, and then have the tools to be able to put it across uh, in, in a personalized and a bespoke fashion or towards a certain, certain, uh, certain cause cause or reason. Now, as soon as I brought that point across and I told them, look, here's all your data that you have collected over the past 10 years, and here's a platform, a CDP platform that you can now create a segment based of all the information that you have about these people. Here's your opportunity to be able to start crafting the high intent cohorts or high opportunity cohorts. Now, you have unlimited or infinite uh, amount of opportunities. That's go ahead, go, yeah. go play yeah. it. Now, suddenly they do not find themselves conformed or limited by a handful of uh, or finite amount of uh, ideas to test. Now they have created a complete uh, roadmap of the kind of tests that they will run. Yeah. Now, I believe I am I'm on the cusp of touching the true democratization of data and decentralizing to harness uh, or rather to to reach out to to realizing the final goal that is uh, customer obsessive uh, personalization 
No, that's that's a fascinating point you bring because I think one of the things that gets often overlooked, and this is something that uh, we discuss over and over and over again, is that data really unleashes opportunity. You know, the the opportunities to really identify meaningful segments or audiences, etc., really just explodes once you understand how to sort of collect, organize data. Right? Yeah, fascinating. I, uh, yeah, I would, but I would like to you know reemphasize and bring the point back to need. The need, need has to be there from the company from top down. To understand and then therefore have a, a clear mandate to be able uh, to have a structured data collection strategy and the need has to be realized or informed or or uh, discovered right at the grassroots level only then will you be able to get them to be accepting of all the training of all the insistence and all, even the top-down diktat that comes absolutely absolutely so i think if i would really sort of collate and uh, all of your response it would be need at the top uh, which sort of results in i would say vision which results in uh, commitment and the mindset to embrace change uh, and then as you sort of practically execute on the ground the two things that i heard one is sort of get used to failure or flux uh, which is what eugene was saying and then of course the training element which which sort of all of us uh, touched upon as well yeah so so wonderful sort of responses there so uh, let's just sort of shift gears and sort of ask because i think no conversation on uh, intelligent marketing is really complete i would say uh, without a reference to uh, ML or AI, right? And I think this, all of us can agree that there is a lot of mischaracterization of these of these terms today. Uh, in fact, I think we've all seen the running memes on what uh, AI looks like in a VC deck uh, versus the Excel file analysis that it actually is, right? So I think as leaders, when you think of technologies like AI, ML, which are sort of, uh, you know, uh, often nebulous uh, in its possibilities, but also if used correctly, can really take things to the next level. How do you focus the discussion and sort of decision making around something like this. Eugene, maybe you could jump in. I'll go to Ram after that and India after that. Sure, sure. So, so it's a buzzword, right? And and consultants love to use uh, certain buzzwords. It gets people excited. Um, the understanding of AI ML is is not there yet. Uh, it's very similar to things like blockchains. Uh, it's a complex thing. People go, oh, I want to be participating in it. Um, I believe that if I did it, I will be better. The reality is you need to really look at uh, what it does for you, all right? Uh, and a lot of technology actually isn't where we want it to be even today. Uh, we're still far away from the um, terminated sort of technology where we've got robots doing things for us, uh, etc. So we've got to be mindful that uh, we don't put ourselves too far ahead into the future of fantasy land, but actually bring it back to using the data properly, using scientific ways to analyze it, and using machines to help us make things quicker. The objective of AI and ML is to connect these dots much faster than what potentially we could have done. Look, the, the computer itself has changed in the past 30 years. And if you know, like I was told somewhere, right, the, the, the first computer in the world is probably the size of your phone today, right? And that was how big it was that, that time. So as technology improves and as we get better at building these uh, systems, um, we'll be able to make connections faster. And yes, eventually, uh, AI and ML will be a mainstay and it will be common in the industry. But at this point in time, it's still rare to find really good softwares that can do that. Uh, and so organizations shouldn't be too excited about it. They should go back to the basics and ask ourselves like what Gigi is talking about. Why do we need this? Do Are we ready for this? Are we structured enough ready for this before we're thinking about and AI or ML can really help us accelerate. That's going to come a bit later. Absolutely. No, I, I certainly agree with you on that. And I think, uh, if I may say, there was a veiled swipe at you, uh, Ram, because he said consultants use these buzzwords. So I leave it to you to, <laughs> uh, to defend that element and sort of uh, <laughs> bring in your perspective there. Thank you, Super. I, I probably would say that I, we take you from the likes of you guys who, who kind of with the, with your products and then try to tell us that that's what the story Shit. should be so <laughs> maybe we are hand in hand on that one yeah but 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 look i think i think um eugene's spot on in the sense that it, it still is early days um when it comes to the application of um ai and machine learning a lot of that um is obviously from the fact that you know we've not seen demonstrated results in a consistent con in a in a, in a in a sustained kind of way because it's still his early days, and 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 that's probably one of the reasons why you would find that the great the other the other impediment to using 
um, AI or, or, or machine learning has been, again, I go back to the point I make about, you know, access to data. Um, and, and, and that's not easy for, you know, for a lot of the, lot of the organizations, you know, and understand the fact that if you, you know, for, for any good AI ML platform to generate a more accurate set of outcomes, it has to be on, has to be trained on a significant set of data before it actually starts to generate value. So, so again, it, it does take time and, you know, the, the, the last thing that marketing people have is time. And they're asked to kind of you know put it out there, <laughs> so <laughs> and I think that's also a bit of the challenge. But but I think I think um, if I were to um, um, say that, you know AI and ML will will be a cornerstone in the way real time decisions get to be presented to customers uh, because of the way that interactions have changed, and it's changed permanently, right? You want to be there when the customer is um, interacting with you. You want to present something to them. The marketing person is not going to be there 24 seven looking at a at a screen to say what can I present next. So you're going to need, you know, capabilities like real time decisioning capabilities that are going to make some of those determination and present uh, in an in an in an um, uh, unsupervised kind of way. So I think I think this is the new reality. We've got to embrace that new reality. You know. When do I decide which offer to make, and and do I do it now because I just noticed that this customer has done something? You need this is the this is the new world. We got to get ready for this new world, and 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 irrespective of which sector that you operate in, that's the new reality. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, one of the one of the insurers that we've been working with uh, on the travel insurance. One of the findings that we had was that a lot of the people would buy travel insurance uh, between um, about you know sort of 10 p.m. in the night and going up to about 2 a.m. in the morning. And we analyzed this further. We realized that a lot of them were undertaking their journey the next day or so. So, so people are making decisions almost near real time, and they're looking for someone who's out there ready to you know to 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 to, to satisfy requirements. And therefore, you know. Forget about the time that you have to go and explain the product to them. They know this, so you want to be able to present it in a moment and get them to make a decision and get get it done at that point in time. So that is the new reality, and and to to do that, these kind of tools um, are going to become very important in the marketer's um, uh, you know toolkit. And so this will definitely continue to evolve, and this will be very important for. Uh, from from a marketing perspective, going forward, if if you need to make this work, so that's that's what I would put it. Got it, got it. So, got it. Ajit, what's your think? Because I think the the consensus seems to be uh, the time for AI will come. There are probably more foundational uh, problems to tackle, and maybe uh, you know uh, more sort of low hanging fruits, if you will. But of course, AI does have its value. So, do you agree? Because I also know that you love sort of toying around with uh, technologies, and uh, you know you've you've tried a lot of stuff as well. So, what's your take on this? Yeah, this is all how our uh, us technocrats have started our lives. We were gadget freaks first. We always like to tinker around with the new, new toy, new, new gadget in the market. But then again, that's what uh, my connotation of technology is. It was always magical. And AI and ML is uh, yet another uh, leaf in that playbook of of, of uh, uh, democratizing magic and having some logic to it, if I may say so. Um, no, I think uh, my take is. Yes, I completely agree that uh, AI ML's time will come. And it's not yet here. I also acknowledge that uh, both AI and ML are highly depend upon uh, data in retrospect. And going back to your previous question, and Eugene was bring, uh, sorry, Ram was bringing upon points that the data is so scattered that people have not even figured out where the data resides. Uh, let alone bringing it together or let alone uh, using it uh, or democratizing it. And I'll, I'll add one more let alone, let alone even feeding it to an AI or ML engine, right? Now, that means you have to start now to be able to realize your AI, ML use cases maybe in the future to come, to be able to just walk pace with the industry. And if you were to delay it, any further, that means you already are that much behind. So point one, start now with your data cleanup, 
data um, uh, orchestration, ingestion, clean, uh, you know, aggregation and enrichment uh, strategies. The second point is, I am also going to um, recognize that there are some people uh, or some companies who have already taken a few strides in AI and ML, have created uh, various nifty products. I'd say self-driving cars is a very good example, uh, which will become re real pretty soon, right? And uh, But something that we've already have started uh, experience or we already have started using is, let's say, the Netflix, the binge watching that we do, automatically is running an engine at the back end at Netflix and giving you your next recommendation. Now that's perhaps the crudest form of AI or the Spotify list or it gets created. The point I'm trying to make is people who have already cracked it or who are already doing it, they already are going to be ahead. Even when the reality becomes real, right? When, when shit gets real, if I may say. All the more reason to start early, yeah. yeah. The point I'm actually making is why wait? While you're extract, while you're collecting your data and making it robust to be able to do it yourself, maybe in sometime in the future, uh, the hack self or you know my hustle self or my hacking self essentially says, let's leverage these people. Let's uh, let's just write on the uh, the the coat tails of these people who already have cracked it and start uh, extracting value out of uh, AI and ML that these guys are already doing. Take for example yours, uh, Lemnis. You've got Ramanujan, you've got your AI platform. When we ran some uh, use cases, we could already extract some uh, some learnings out of it. And while we were still sort of figuring out our uh, user journey orchestration across uh, channels, uh, you or your team offered essentially saying, hey, why don't you just throw us all the content? We're going to churn it out of uh, Ramanujan. In about three months time, I could already see that we could get 20% higher uh, open rates or higher click rates just because uh, there was a, we decided to take a leap of faith and put it into an uh, AI ML black box yeah. of sorts. So, so look, there is a leap of faith that you guys can take. So uh, uh, I wouldn't say that AI and ML while the, while the product or while the practice is getting matured, uh, you shouldn't uh, leave it, uh, or you should completely leave it, or you should uh, you should not em embark on it or on harness it with people who already have cracked it. Got it. No, absolutely. I think start early is your message, and uh, yeah, I mean, I do. You know, I think I have obviously seen that people who jump into uh, AI without really sort of getting the basics right uh, also struggle and sort of almost inevitably get uh, get disillusioned. So uh, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would have loved to throw in one more question. This is such a fascinating discussion. I would have loved to sort of uh, uh, get your sort of minds on a couple of more questions, but uh, we're sort of just reaching the 45 minute mark here. So uh, I would you know, really like to close the session. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. It was an incredibly, incredibly insightful session. I think I really enjoyed speaking with you, uh, as I'm sure the audience did uh, as well. Uh, so thanks a lot for your time and uh, thank you for joining today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wonderful. So uh, great. As I said, we have a packed agenda today. So we'll just uh, dive right into the next session where, as I said, we will bring you a deep exploration uh, of what it takes to implement and execute a customer data platform driven digital marketing strategy. So uh, I would like to next invite Michael Justin Devera or Miko as he goes by. Uh, just a quick introduction to uh, to Miko from previously managing digital accounts at uh, MRM McCann. Miko now heads AIA Film Life's digital marketing team, tackling brand building to performance marketing initiatives. Uh, he oversees the Philippines' uh, premier insurance company's digital content, paid distribution, performance marketing measurement, and marketing technology. Uh, truly, digital is his passion because he also serves as a lecturer uh, in the leading provider for digital training, certified digital marketer. So I think uh, if the title is Notes uh, from the Martech Battlefront, then what better way to learn? Dan from the general who's also a professor. So uh, on that note, Miko, the stage is all yours. Uh, welcome. Thanks again for doing this with us today. Hey, Subra. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks also for the opportunity. Um, really happy to be here. Um, hold on. Let me just prepare.
Just want to check, Subra, is my screen um, showing up properly? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, you great, continue. great. Okay, um, well, good afternoon, everyone, for those in Southeast Asia. Um, really happy to be here, and I, I thank the Lemnis team for inviting me to have this opportunity to share my experience and hopefully impart some personal notes to actually help you progress your marketing technology or martech journeys wherever you know maturity level you are um, we've been working with subra and team for more than one one and a half years now right subra so i hope um, all the things that we've um, collected the insights uh, good things and bad things we've learned from the experience will really help you uh, move forward um, these points hopefully are you'll find it insightful um, but at the same time, actionable, regardless of, again, where you are in terms of your journey or digital marketing maturity. Okay, so I, I guess before I go into the notes, the, the specific notes I want to impart today, it would be best first to really set the context properly. So you'll be able to understand it from my lens or where our team is actually coming, coming from. So like what Subred said um, earlier, um, I sit under the digital marketing team and Usually, you know, when you talk about digital marketing, um, we usually refer to this very old device, but still very relevant, um, which is the marketing funnel. And as part of the digital marketing team, usually it's really catering across objectives, departments, and, you know, different PNLs, whatever campaigns that's being briefed on. Um, it's something that we, we worked on. And especially with the times that we have today, um, digital marketing is really the preferred channel and the preferred platform in almost all platforms, right? And I think um, to just to quote the discussion earlier with Ram, Gigi, and Eugene is that it's all about picking the, the signals. May it be signals across awareness, consideration, or if you want to use the Google language of see, think, do, and care, um, definitely digital marketing actually sits and it really caters almost end to end of it, right? But behind the scenes, actually, um, things that our team are also delivering or are we are actually also juggling a lot of these things. Now we have so many digital marketers in the audience today. So I guess you you would agree that beneath the surface of digital marketing as a discipline, you know that there are sub disciplines, um, not only in support of the campaigns, but also the bigger company strategic imperatives as well. Or sometimes we call it, you know, always on or business as usual. So. In a day, most likely you'll be juggling between campaigns, BAU work or business as usual work or strategic things that um, is also urgently, equally urgently needed, right? So that's really a role of a digital marketer. Um, it's multidiscipline, um, but as, as well as cross-functional and again, cross-funnel. So all of these things um, really sits well in the perspective when we first met um, or encountered a CDP because um, later on you'll see that if not all, um, all of these pieces will really benefit if you're able to actually maximize a CDP. And um, earlier, Subra also mentioned that um, these are the things I do in a work sense and a professional capacity, but actually even on the weekends, um, I also teach. No? Um, in select week weekends, um, around one to two Saturdays per month, um, I do teach um, in a digital training provider platform here in the Philippines. Um, so you can really say that equally digital marketing is my profession, but at the same time, teaching and learning actually are my vocation. So without further ado, um, I'd like to share these notes Personal things that I've written down that uh, I realized as we go went through and still going through rather the journey of um, our CDP and even our market marketing technology journey. And it has been one and a half years um, with the Lemnus team. Some are quite basic at first glance, but for me, and I hope you agree, it made me really think further how we should approach this vis-a-vis um, -vis the bigger picture. You know, whatever bigger picture you're talking about, may it be your, your company's OKRs, um, or your company's strategic imperatives. So all of these things you really have to embrace, you know. And I hope you'll find these insightful, again, equally insightful and actionable as well. So... We'll be talking about what is a CDP and what it is not. Um, I think there's a lot of discussions. And I myself, you know, first encountering it, um, I was really confused on um, what it is compared to the other SaaS tools available out there. Then we'll go through how um, 
it would be beneficial to actually select and prioritize your use case or use cases as you decide to invest time, money, and talent into a CDP. Where is the data? Um, earlier, a lot of discussion about democratizing data, empowering intelligence with the panel earlier. So we'll touch on that as well. And I think a fourth um, consideration is really how to understand and how to properly do your integration. And last, it doesn't end there. You know, it doesn't end at um, launch day. I think that's the beauty of digital marketing or marketing in general is that the, the work only starts on day one and it will continue on a day-to-day -day basis because equally optimization is a beauty and a curse. You know? So these are the things I, I want to impart throughout um, you know, my next 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, so for the first point is that, um, again, when, when I first encountered CDP, and this was way back almost two years ago when, when the Lemnis team started their, you know, their credentials presentation, their product um, presentation, and okay, so Subra, is it an automation tool? Is it a marketing automation tool? No, okay, so is it a CRM tool? Because you're saying it essentially provides a single customer view and, and the answer was no. Um, so what is it? Uh, needless to say, I couldn't really put my finger on it. Uh, so what, what is it an LMS? What is it? So in its own sense, it's, a, it's its own best of breed platform, which is a customer data platform. And it took a series of meetings, to be honest, um, mixed with own readings, you know, things I had to um, read on my own, that, that then I fully understand, understood what it really does and what it doesn't do and ha how it can potentially maximize the things that we've already invested on in terms of marketing technology, but in general, in terms of content marketing as well. So for me, and this, this is what really helped me understood it after, meeting a lot of sessions, doing a lot of sessions with the Lemnis team is that, okay, so it serves like a brain, you know, in the sense that the brain doesn't actually do the actual activity, like, you know, walking or talking or eating, but what it does, it actually orchestrates, you know, um, it tells you, it tells the nerve endings, it tells the different um, parts of your body, oh, this is the feedback that we got, this is what you'll do. So when I when I threw that concept to, to the team and all the working team, they said, ah, okay, so that's how a CDP actually performs. And with, with that analogy, it really helped me understand the two sides of the CDP, you know. On the left side, um, you have to consider the data input, the things that you feed it into, which is equally important as the things on the right side, which we'll talk about. You can be talking about, you know, things that you already know about your customer, or even your leads, such as first party, the, the data that you know about, uh, that you get from your partners, you know, co-brands, or even um, third um, health um, partners that you work with, like maybe for insurance, health, and wellness, um, is it medical partners, or for banking, is it um, lifestyle brands that you work with or merchants, right? But at the same time, you can also complement it with third party providers and, you know, we, we can go all day with um, and talk about all the providers that we can get. But at the same time, these aren't, you can look at it at that lens of offline data, things that you don't have um, on the cloud or you don't have on a website or an application and data that you know about your customers online. And we know even before the discussion of a CDP, we know that all of these data points are equally empowering. Um, again, the ultimate goal at the end of the day is always data-driven marketer, uh, marketing as a marketer, right? But like said earlier, it's really about how do I integrate all of these things? Um, after finding out where all of these things are, you know, considering your data governance uh, maturity, how do I make sense out of it? And that's where the brain or the CDP comes in because the CDP actually ingests all of these data points. But at the same time, aside from, you know, just serving a consolidation, imagining all your Excel files combined into just one master file, it actually profiles, it segments. Since it's able to ingest all of these data points, you are enriched with more data, but more than that, actually integrated data. Things I, that I know about my customers offline, now I can already know things and complement it with things I know about them online into just one picture. And it doesn't end there. You know, in, in that sense, it's 
really, really exciting and powerful. But as marketers, where we really get the most out of it, where we drive our, our KPIs and move the needle is actually the, the activation. How do I make sense? How do I maximize this new gold that I've unearthed with a CDP or with a brain? And the beauty of um, a CDP and most CDP um, delivers this and such as Lemnus is that it has its own built-in marketing automation um, feature wherein it can create out of these segments that it created, it will create, it can create campaigns, it can help you put in business rules, things that you can say next best content, next best offer, next best product across select um, channels that you also integrate it with. Again, similarly like a brain. So you can talk about personalized experience on a website, notifications, emails, SMS, or even throw back the data to your call center to empower your customer service representatives about the things that you know about your customers online and offline, or even actually your chatbot. So again, the, the name of the game in terms of making sure that it's an end-to-end -end is really integration, which we'll talk about later on. It's, it's not just a one-way street, you know, it doesn't just go left to right as seen here. Uh, the beauty of, of the data and the flow is that it, it will be a cycle. The things that you pick up, the engagements that you pick up from these channels, so you, you can feed it back or it's actually fed in back into the CDP and you can empower and enrich the things again that you have on the left side. So you can really imagine it um, like a brain um, serving that cycle of data input to ingestion, profiling, segmentation, and ultimately until output or activating your campaigns. And let's take a step back on the different types of CDP that actually provides. It's perfectly It perfectly sits well in this diagram, right? There are CDP providers that actually focus on the left side, which is really um, collecting and integrating the data. That's called data CDP. There are um, CDPs that actually provide the two steps, which is ingesting it, profiling and segmenting it, and you know creating all of these different types of segments that you can use later on, but it stops there. But essentially what Lemnisk as a CDP does, it caters it end to end. It inputs, ingests, profile segments, and actually activates it. And technically you can call it as a campaign CDP. And again, depending on the maturity, depending on the pieces that you have, into your on your marketing picture, you'll have to decide which ones do you need. Is it just a best of breed of uh, certain um, offering, or do you want something um, all in one? Next point is, let's say you've already understood. Okay, this is how the CDP works. You know, I want to use the analogy that Miko said, which is a brain. Okay, clear. Um, we're all on board. It's something that I can um, afford in terms of ta time, talent, and money. Now, how do I choose? which one I want to try it with. And again, most of the providers that you might talk to um, are open to POC. So how do I um, how do I really identify how will I use it first? And truth be told, this is one piece of the journey where we really took our time. Again, I think we had a workshop, you know, and then after the workshop, oh no, it's not going to work. You know, after a whole day workshop, we looked at the use case, nope, it's not going to work. We, we threw it out the window and then we created the new use case and then lo and behold, we, we, fi we finalized the use cases that we want to do after three to five, six, six months, you know. And I'm not saying that that's the case for everyone. Um, again, hopefully the notes that I have will help you launch sooner than how we did it before. But I'm just um, being honest on how we actually approached it. And I realized, again, as, as a note from the battlefield is that Look at your North, North Star, you know, North Star as a starting point. Then from there, you can actually prioritize using your use cases. Gigi mentioned earlier about a good goal setting framework that I think um, a lot of tech, uh, digital natives have learned to embrace and really advocate within their company. Um, some of the incumbents are a little bit late in the game, but I think this will really help. Um, it's about the OKRs or objective and key results, which will really help you identify what's the vision, what's the what's the needle that needs to be moved by end of year, by you know by by end of quarter. Um, what are the things that we really have to prioritize, the vital few, and it serves as a good starting point to select your use case because at the end of the day, you don't want to be doing something that that won't really actually make an impact 
to the company's strategic goals, right? So what better way to actually convince the management team that, hey, we need to um, invest in the CDP by actually showing them impact, you know, immediate impact on the things that you want to drive on a long-term basis, yeah? So after you pin down um, the, your OKRs or the OKR that you want to drive, then you can actually dig deeper into the specific use cases across the funnel. You know, you can talk about um, lookalike targeting or providing the next best content or doing a personalization for first-time visitors, you know, at the top of the funnel. Or maybe in the middle, you'll talk about driving lead generation, new, totally new lead generation, or do you want to retarget those fallout? Or you want to capture additional lead gens from those exiting the site or your application, for perhaps. And then lower, um, assisting your distribution channel. Do you want to talk about assignment? Do you want to empower your distribution or your sales force with additional customer data that the CDP actually ingests? Or maybe optimize how you do your conversion rates on your, your platform or your last mile delivery, right? And right before, you know, the tip of the top fun funnel is that you, the CDP can also help in terms of, you know, driving app or portal registrations, utilization, or even onboarding new customers. So again, all of these things are sexy, all of these things are exciting, but if these things do not you know, ladder up back to the OKR that your company is actually driving, then you wouldn't really get the buy-in that you want. And even not, um, even below the funnel, even for existing customers, um, the CDP actually brings in a value as well. Again, earlier I, I mentioned that you can connect it back to your chatbot for after sales, for uh, an omni-channel experience, or you can personalize the experience on the app or the portal, or even just in the com um, nurturing communications that you, you do across email, or even you know um, first party ads that you do in social display video, et cetera. And of course, um, you wanna drive more upsell, resell, and really repurchase for your existing customers, um, which is naturally more efficient. So again, the CDP really empowers us to do a next best offer, drive these things on a referral and an absolute basis. So in no way, this is a whole picture of the different use cases you can explore. But the main point here in this um, second tip is really look at your North Star. What is your vision? What's your um, company's OKRs for the year? How can you help? And assuming that you've already understood wh where the CDP really brings in value, then you're on the right track. You're guided with your North Star to, to select, prioritize the use case that you want. Now, the third point is with the use cases pinned down, you already know, okay, I want to drive, a, you know, uh, maybe awareness, I want to drive consideration, I want to drive lead generation, or I want to provide an omni-channel personalized experience for my customers. Now you have a direction. And the finish line, you can already imagine the finish line. This is where I want to go. You know, after the, the use case duration, or maybe after the POC duration, this is where I want to land at right the next critical discussion you have to tackle is really to understand where the data is and again this is another very critical part of the discussion because now you have to not only put on your marketer's hat like what um, eugene said earlier not all marketers are you know very mature in terms of understanding where the data is and how the data is collected and how powerful the data is now you have to put on that hat as well but you're not alone at the end of the day you can work with the teams that you have and it's understanding essentially where the data is vis-a-vis -vis your entire tech landscape of your company and now that's really a rabbit hole of discussions right so the equal this um the equal challenge really is how do you understand where the data is what is it what is it all about like what ram mentioned earlier how can you maximize this data? How can you democratize this data? Subra also mentioned it earlier. How do you maximize this intelligence in terms of empowering your marketing, essentially data-driven marketing? And depending on your organization's maturity on data governance, you know, um, how you build and architect your tech stack and your data availability, a lot of factors can come into play. And some of the key questions I had, you know, looking back, I've added it here and hopefully it will help you identify it. Because the name of the game in terms of identifying where the data is, is really literally understanding the nature of the data and where it actually sits, right? Where is the data located? Is it readily available? Is it something that I can get 
let's say we decide to launch the POC or launch the CDP from X days from now, is it readily available? Is it clean? I think, you know, these are fundamental questions that you have to ask. And you'll be surprised that incumbents and equally sometimes digital natives have different levels of maturity, right, in terms of that um, of data handling. Second, um, what are the minimum data fields you need? You know, the, the pitfall of common marketers is that, okay, let's put in all the data into the CDP, but we only will use 10% of it. From a, you know, putting on a risk hat, that's really risky, you know, um, being in insurance, in the, being in the business of risks, that's something that you really have to think about. Because if you're not going to maximize the 90% of the data that you input on the CDP, why are you going to put it in? The rule of thumb is really just maximize, uh, maximize, yes, the data fields that you need, but actually use it. You know, don't just leave it hanging or just sitting in the CDP. Otherwise, it can be a risk, not only a risk of you know, not maximizing your investment, but potentially a bigger risk in terms of data privacy, right? Third is that, what is the unique identifier across sources? Um, yes, CDP seems like a magic tool, but it cannot... Um, rely on its own to ingest all of these data points we've mentioned earlier. You need to tell and guide the CDP what would be unique across all platforms. Do you assign a unique ID, a number, a code, or maybe um, is the email addresses um, unique across all of these data points, or maybe you know account numbers? So what is that unique identifier that you can anchor on to ingest all of these data points? And fourth, um, some things that you also have to ask your provider is in terms of security and risk compliance. You know, I think most of the attendees here today most maybe on the retail side or maybe on the financial services side, but equally security and risk compliance are, are things that's very talked about right now, um, depending on um, how your regulation is worked. Okay. So that is the third point. You need to understand how to maneuver through your data and tech landscape. I'm not saying become someone from IT. I myself, I, I don't have an IT background. You know, I, I started from advertising. So um, I rely on the teams that I work with to be able to maneuver this um, going into the CDP integration. Which brings me to the next point about integration. You know, the first time I heard about it, oh, it's simple as connecting. You know, connecting systems. I want to connect system A with system B with system C. But I realized it's actually beyond that. And I keep hearing these questions um, when ever since we started meeting about the CDP, you know, one and a half years ago. And up to now, it's still it's still being popped out in the, the meetings that we still have, you know. Because um, integration behind the scenes actually tackle or um, affects or impacts a lot of things on how you will deliver the CDP, how you will deliver um, the, the campaigns that you will do. Yeah. So you have transfer, activation, etc. So when you say transfer, um, some things that you know I've heard from the meeting, okay, what is the data frequency? What is the flow frequency? How how often do you need the data actually flowed into the CDP and back as a cycle? And um, do you need it real time? How do you need it transferred? Is it through an API or just a flat file or just implementing tags um, and JavaScripts on their site or in your application? Activation, is your API readily available? You know, you'd be surprised. Um, um, a lot of incumbents actually are still just starting that journey into um, prepare, making sure that they are openly connected to different systems, not only within the company, but even um, external parties such as a CDP. So those things, those critical questions you have to ask with um, to your IT team. If not, how soon can you go live? How, will, how long will it take for the backend developers to actually provide that for us? Enrichment, what additional data can you complement? about what you already know. Obviously, as, as um, brand owners in the audience today, you have your own rich, um, rich data that you have about your customers, but it doesn't stop there. What are the other things that you want to feed into and complement into your data? Again, integration also comes into play. Optimization, if I do a specific thing on the site or in the app, how often and how soon will the changes actually reflect? Uh, this equally is a, a factor into how to make sure that your campaigns will actually perform better. 
and my favorite is really attribution. How would you say that the condition that you've set, the rules that you've set, um, the call to action that you've set is successful? And can you can you identify it real time? Like if a customer clicks a particular button on a channel campaign or an engagement campaign that you've put in, will it will the feedback will the report be reflected on the database or in the system real time? And how soon will Lemnisk school or the CDP will actually find out that it happened so? Because um, otherwise, if you, you don't have that attribution, that success criteria, you won't really see the impact immediately of your, of your CDP campaigns that you're running. Next, um, this is a credo that I, I really like to believe that has actually guided me thus far and continue to be a personal advocacy of mine. You know, you always have to advocate that you're always in beta mode. You know, you're always in an experiment mindset and really embracing a growth mindset. Earlier, I, I, I mentioned that optimization and digital marketing is equally a beauty of it, but at the same time a curse. And it will never be perfect. You know, I'll, I'll admit it to you, it will never never be perfect at the first time. In, in fact, Voltaire said that perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, um, it's better that you get things going um, in a not so perfect environment or setup versus wait for the perfect time. That's why there's so much discussions on being agile in general, right? And when you talk about digital marketing, um, optimization is another name of the game. And that's something that I always tell my students um, as well when, when I do my training programs is that don't, don't be pressured to make it perfect, you know, your media plan, your content plan, your campaign plan, it won't be perfect from the get-go. That's what, what's more important is actually you, you optimize it. And that's the same advocacy that we embraced when we started running our CDP. And a particular process or framework that I encountered um, in, 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 the, in a book that I've read really helped me to do that. You know, um, maybe some of you are familiar with the growth hacking process wherein you you analyze, you know, um, you analyze, you you um, analyze and um, identify the learnings on specific metrics that matter. Again, going back to the OKRs, um, and then you enlist ideas, you know, and sustain that rich and steady pool of experiments that you want to um, drive at, and then prioritize which ones would actually work best using different um, prioritization framework like ICE or impact confidence and ease cost benefit analysis or even just an action priority matrix so to identify which of the ideas which should, should I do or test now and then eventually build a team that that really encourages um, working towards testing more and in high tempo and high frequency and high sprints right in no way don't get me wrong in no way we don't have a growth hacking team um, in AIA film life but this framework really helped us a lot in realizing that there will always be room for experiments. I, I like Eugene's point earlier when he talked about, you know, a lot of marketers um, tend to really just remain stagnant, you know, static. But um, I think a good, um, a good skill and a good um, approach for marketers right now is actually having an experiment mindset or a growth mindset. And I think this framework will help. And in the same vein, you know, um, this thing I, I've learned because I've really embraced this um, experiment mindset. So some a habit that I've um, developed uh, a few years back is continue continuously learning, not only teaching, but continuously learning. So there's so many books about growth hacking. There's so many books about data-driven marketing or experimentation mindset. And I, I just took a screenshot on Google of the things that you can search for when you enter growth hacking, right? And I guess the importance of of optimization aside from um, realizing that perfect is the enemy of good is that 1% change over time when you compound it, it actually makes a bigger impact. So you don't have to also pressure yourself, okay, I do this test, um, like A-B testing, testing send times, frequency, frequency capping, testing different channels, or even audience targeting. It doesn't have to be a big change from the get-go. That 1% change, as long as you do it regularly and consistently, that will compound to a bigger impact by the end of the campaign. Yeah, so some books that maybe you wanna look into later on. 
So in recap and in sum- summary, um, these are the five points I've talked about earlier. Understanding what a CDP is or what it is not. Is it a CRM? Is it an LMS? Is it a marketing automation tool? No. Um, how to identify and prioritize the use case that you want to use. Identifying and maneuvering where the data is. Understanding integration. And once you've already launched, making sure that you have an experimentation management set and really embrace the power of optimization. And I guess if you are able to pin these downs, the uh, pin the, these down when you implement your CDP, is that you will really be able to maximize your investment. At the end of the day, I want to caution you that a CDP is essentially just a tool. The same way that you have a tool at home, like a hammer and a nail, it's it's supposed to do one thing, but it always depends on how you'll use it, right? So if you're able to pin down these basic things and um, you work with um, your provider, work with your, your um, team internally, then you'll really maximize what the CDP does. Essentially, it is a personalization engine, okay? Um, that is very results oriented, grounded on data with real-time capability and can deliver growth for you, okay? And again, thank you, Lemnus team. This has been great. In fact, um, aside from sharing these, this short playbook I've prepared, this also allowed me to reflect on the journey we've had for more than you know, one and a half years now. And to quote John Dewey, he said, we actually do not learn experience outright. You know, we, we, we remember that we learn from experience. No, actually, we learn from a- from reflecting on the experience that we have. And just to add in a few more um, critical questions to ask, you know, maybe th- um, additional notes you want to write down or um, get a screenshot of is understanding all of these questions and asking these critical questions, not only with your provider, but with your partners internally. What's that most pressing issue that you need addressed? Again, your OKR. Is your use case maximizing the power of CDP? Truth be told, a lot of use cases we threw in the workshop and threw in the brainstorm- brainstorming sessions is, wasn't really didn't really need a CDP. It, we could do it without a CDP. We could do it without C, without Lemnisk. Again, that's not really leveraging the, the investment that you have. How does the CDP actually fit in the bigger marketing picture? It should be you know one of the critical pieces that you put into that jigsaw puzzle. What are the inherent risks and controls you have in place to ensure that data integrity, data privacy, all of these breaches are actually avoided? And of course, the most important is what's the picture of success? How do you see picture after um, this POC or after your campaign? Okay, and with that, thank you. Um, if you want to connect, um, just add me in LinkedIn or you can also sa- scan this QR code. Wonderful, wonderful. Miko, thank you so much. That was an incredible uh, session. And I think for folks listening in, I'm sure it was uh, super insightful for you as well. Um, and I and I hope that if you're thinking of uh, a CDP for your organization, you will take away, I think, a lot of valuable learnings from, uh, from, from today's session. So Miko, once again, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time out today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Uber, and thanks, to, thanks for the team. Right, so uh, on to our last session for the evening. I'm super excited to present this one to you as well. And I think this particular session uh, that we have right now will uh, will fit perfectly well uh, with the other two sessions that we had just now. Uh, so if the panel was all about subject matter leadership on customer intelligence and uh, uh, Miko's expert labor was about executing from the front line, this session is really all about transformative leadership in the context of MarTech because MarTech because it really, uh, th- this session really tries to bring it all together uh, with the overarching people, organization, and leadership aspects of digital transformation. Uh, because the big picture of MarTech uh, really is an amalgamation of marketing, technology, and management. Uh, these three disciplines, which were siloed till just a few years back, uh, have definitely become uh, inextricably uh, linked now. Marketers have embraced technology. Uh, technologists have uh, embraced design and growth hacking principles. Um, and I think it's really up to management and leadership to synthesize it too, uh, to ensure that the sum is greater than the parts. Now, going digital is already a huge, huge task in any organization. And I think we heard some of the pre- uh, previous speakers touch upon it, right? But doing so uh, in an organization steeped with tradition 
and a century long history of excellence like AIA uh, and across so many countries where it's present, that is in another league altogether. And on that note, uh, I'm really very, very pleased to introduce uh, uh, Prashant Agarwal to you. Uh, Prashant heads uh, digital marketing for AIA Group, Asia's preeminent life insurance major uh, and one of the largest companies in Asia. A marketer, innovator and connector, uh, his industry agnostic career gives him multi-domain knowledge uh, and uh, inter-industry operability. Uh, his varied experience includes building corporate innovation labs, uh, creating startup accelerators, building brands and launching products. He's worked extensively in B2B and B2C environments across all channels, direct retail and digital. Uh, Prashant started his career as uh, Unilever's youngest manager globally and has since worked within banking, insurance and tech across India, USA, Singapore, and Hong Kong. He regularly serves on juries for awards and speaks at international forums uh, on to topics ranging from disruption uh, to analytics masterclasses. He has an MBA from the Harvard School Business School and is an ethic at Alum from Singularity, Darden, IMD, OnCert, and IMA. Prashant, so thrilled uh, to have you today and a very, very, very warm welcome to you on the CDP Summit. Thank you, Subra. That, that was a long introduction and uh, nicer than I deserve. Uh, it's always a tough act to wrap up a conversation as uh, cool as the one you guys are having. Uh, but uh, Miko did most of the work for me because I, I think he made uh, so many points that you and I can uh, uh, help just connect these uh, thoughts together quickly uh, and talk about what are the real human challenges of making all this happen and how do we get around those? Absolutely. And, and you know, Prashant, in all my experience with organizations, um, you know, succeeding in digital transformation that I have seen in the in the last decade, there has been one sort of consistent thread. I really feel that all those organizations uh, were able to align the entire uh, organization around, you know, shared vision and a shared sort of goals, right? Uh, so, um, you know, I, and I think that really talks a lot to this convergence that I spoke of earlier, mm -hmm. the convergence of marketing, technology, uh, and management leadership. Has it been your experience as well? And if so, what is it that really brought this entire ecosystem together? I'd really love to start off there. You know, the convergence is very true, and it's very real. And the convergence comes from the customer, our real boss right the customers everybody's boss and they decide now once upon a time people were actively guided to the choices they made right you you showed them content you held their hand you walked them to a set of choices and then hopefully they made the choice you wanted that's gone consumers today have information overload the items that therefore will cut through all that clutter for them are the ones that are going to connect and for connecting, we need personalization. This it, personalization is really what drives this convergence, uh, as, as you describe it, because the marketing elements, the technology that enables uh, the, that personalization, and frankly, the leadership will, and the management uh, uh, obsession to serve the customer better have to converge. Now, when you look at even the underpinning data, it supports this. Right. So 80 percent of customers say they're more likely to buy from uh, brands that personal provide personalized experiences in a business like uh, ours insurance. We see while we are a very traditional sales uh, driven organization, our sales processes are mostly offline. We see this very interesting reality that 90 percent of people in insurance end up buying life and health insurance end up buying offline. But equally, 90% of people say they will research it online before they would talk to somebody to buy it offline. Now, therein is another convergence of online and offline. But for that online component of those 90%, they are no longer visiting a financial advisor saying the advisor will tell me what to do. They are expecting to do all their homework, have an opinion, have questions, and then have a very, very solid involved conversation. Now, the marketing nudges they get, the technology that delivers it to them, the way they interpret that, it all has to come together to power that. We see more than 90% of shoppers have made uh, purchases that have been influenced by personalized shopping cart recommendations. So whether it's uh, the more traditional businesses on um, retail, but even places like ours, people want to know 
what are you even suggesting to me? And it has to be relevant to me. Right? People are not going to give you multiple uh, chances. And as we see the wealth of access they have to information, people typically, at least in our business, uh, touch an average of five touch points before they make a purchase for life and health insurance. And of these touch points, four are digital. Now, all this means that that convergence has to happen. Mass customization, personalization has to be at scale. And predicting what the customer will want is now the bare minimum. If you can't get that right, you're not even in the game. Yeah. Now, one also wants to connect with the right people at the right time in the right way. Right. So if you are going to come around and poke around in my website and let's face it, you know, we, we are from this industry, so I can be more blunt about it. You must really be interested in life insurance if you're poking around the life insurance company's website. It's not the most exciting place to be in, on, in the online world, right? Now, if you're doing that, that suggests that you are very interested. If I can respond to you quickly, if I can figure out Subra is here, Subra seems to be looking up these five things, let me connect with Subra now. That's when the magic will happen. If I connect with Subra three you know, weeks from now, I've already missed that opportunity, right? So we have to do a lot of that. Now, one of the things that we've seen, back to your convergence uh, concept, the other thing that drove it in a way or hyper accelerated it was COVID. For all the horrible, horrible things that COVID has driven, it has forced companies like ours uh, to transform digitally at speeds that even we didn't know was possible. Because our customer evolved with speeds they did not imagine possible. So whether it is uh, people in uh, China, the elderly people who have traditionally never bought online, we saw that they were going at rapid speeds doing online shopping because that was the only way they could get groceries in certain provinces for, for a period of time. So our customer evolved. And we needed to evolve at the same time. So all of these things have resulted in this convergence becoming very real, very pervasive. And in fact, uh, we've seen that Gartner reported out, I think, recently that uh, more than a third of uh, CMO budgets have started getting allocated to MarTech because MarTech is the mechanism for this convergence. Uh, Prashant, I, I, you touched upon COVID and I'm just really tempted to take a quick detour here. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, what was the conversation like? You know, I think for so many of us, uh, you know, uh, it, it just sort of hit us uh, suddenly out of the blue. So in times like these, uh, you know, as a leader, uh, let's say March or maybe uh, end of March, what, what sort of conversations were you having and uh, how were you really sort of trying to cut through uh, all of this? I, I would really love to... Uh, deep dive a little bit there and then sort of come back because I think everybody in the audience would love to understand that a little better. Now, I think there are many, many conversations on many fronts. So let me take them separately. Team building. I, I have colleagues, some of them are even on this uh, call where we, we hired people sight unseen, right? Because we couldn't be in the same location to onboard them and bring them on because we knew that we have to make these shifts. But from a customer lens, starting with that, uh, AI is very clear that we are a purpose driven company and our purpose is to help people lead healthier, longer, better lives. Now, that purpose has never been more relevant than what COVID created as circumstances. Uh, people who have been uh, blessed to be safe and whose loved ones are fine are still dealing with very simple realities like when your three children are being homes are needing to be homeschooled. That's not easy. Having a career, you you have a you know someone is having Zoom problems. The teachers need the help from the parents to to come in and do extra support. This is not mentally easy for anyone to have adapted to. Second reality is that people have become more aware of their health-related items than they've ever been. So during these times, we saw 50% spike in our markets for people who were searching for ways to remain healthy while being in lockdowns and at home and in quarantines. YouTube uh, stats will show you big spikes in at home wellness and fitness exercise regimes and stuff like that. 
Now, from our perspective, that and and even insurance is a product. You know, as people started conserving cash, uh, we saw across categories, people said, "I will defer a purchase, or I will not consider a purchase across many industries." Insurance they actually were saying, "I think I need more." Right now, our model is face to face. So people are saying we need more protection, and my advisors can't be on, on the road to to go make that happen. So we've had to recognize that our purpose has meant never meant more than it does. We have an accountability to not just serve our people, our customers from the products that we offer, but we also have to go well beyond that. We have to give people comfort. We have to give them peace of mind. We have to give them tangible tactical items. Now, that means we have to deliver them content that is relevant to them. We must know, you know, what a Subra wants is different from what a Miko wants. You guys are at different ages, stages, you're in different locations, your requirements are completely different. If I can understand that, I can serve you both equally well. And I have to automate that. If I'm not, you know, you can't do it manually at that scale. So it's been a, 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 a from a, a, you know, a, it's been horrible for everybody. In that reality, from a business transformation lens, a, a, is a cliched but oft repeated reality that never let a good crisis go waste. I think companies like us have been forced to confront that digital and analog are no longer either or. The only model that works is to bring them together. And our, uh, you know, I'm just incredibly proud of the way AI as a company has reacted and responded during this time. I'm very proud of the way our uh, a- agents and advisors have really stepped up. They've gone out of their way to accommodate what customers need. No, just I, no. Thanks for taking the detour, and I think I could, I can definitely vouch for it because I was sort of obviously interacting with you and team uh, through the last year as well, and I, I really felt that the overall approach was uh, incredibly positive and sort of, you know, how how can we make this better for the customers? So yeah, I mean, uh, th- thanks for taking the detour, but just sort of. Uh, <laughs> Um, coming back to the sort of uh, convergence that we spoke of, mm-hmm. and just deep into it, this a little bit, I think this convergence has also meant that you had to create alignments between different teams and functions that probably right. is hard to achieve, right? And I think if I were to really touch upon it, you know, how do you align the uh, uh, the, the creative marketer, if you will, um, and, and the coding nerd, right? At first glance, these are almost two different beasts, as as wide apart as as, as two professions could possibly be. So then how do you make uh, each one understand the essence of the other and make them effective together? Your thoughts there would be appreciated. Yes, I, I love the characterization, the creative market and the coding nerd. I think my tech uh, friends and your tech friends will kill you for that one. <laughs> uh, it really... <laughs> it, really <laughs> it really is the question of the art and the science of marketing, really, right? When you look at the coding nerd versus the creative marketer. Truth is that they are not binary anymore, right? Given the reality of the attention spans, and uh, we all have heard of the uh, limited attention spans of goldfish, what nine seconds, and consumers today have less than that. Uh, Eugene tells me that uh, goldfish actually have more attention span than than these reports can say. But irrespective of that, uh, you know the the message needs to cut through the clutter, and therefore it needs to be creative. You don't notice the mundane things anymore, right? Uh, If you ask me right now, what billboards advertising have I walked past in getting from my train station to my office? I couldn't tell you. And I walk past that twice a day for days on end, right? Now, equally, it has to be delivered in a very effective manner. And it has to be very relevant to my need and and the time I consume that message in. So given all these parameters, tech is the only way to deliver this in a scalable manner. Now, this is where the coders come in, therefore, to design those tech enablers, but they also have the opportunity to be very creative in their own right so that the marketing itself becomes creative in the way it was delivered on the channel and and the platforms. So this style and substance have converged. Now, again, Gartner, I think, uh, indicates that by 2022, about 25% of the marketing 
participants will actually have dedicated behavioral scientists and ethnographers as part of their full-time staff. Completely makes sense because you will need the, the creative marketers will become more nerdy and the coding nerds will become more creative and they need to, right? And this is where I think MarTech comes in, right? And a, a lot of points that Miko was making were really um, relevant to the point I make now. Marketing functions have to become very data driven. They have to be, marketers now have to be technologically savvy. For me to say that's the coding guy's problem, it uh, doesn't work anymore. I don't need to know how to code. I need to know what I need that code to do for me, right? In that process, solutions that are going to automate and enable will act as the glue that connects the, uh, uh, the creative marketer and the coding nerd together. Now, whether it's your solution, which uh, we've been very upfront in the sessions that we've been working with you guys, or even other broad MarTech solutions, they all drive this convergence. They reduce that gap because they allow the creative marketer to be a coding nerd without knowing coding. And they allow the coding nerd to become a creative marketer without knowing marketing. Yeah. And that is going to become supremely important. Now, solutions like you guys are not designed to be run by only experts. Experts get a different type of performance out of those solutions. But they're designed to enable people who are non-experts to punch well above their weight. So they, they have a dual purpose. And I think that's what we are going to see way more of. I believe that MarTech is going to become a very standard part of marketing. And everyone is going to be very focused on what their marketing stack looks like and how do they plug those gaps. Well, it's a very, very valid point. And I think you place the onus to some extent on the technology that you adopt as well, which I think is actually a great way of, uh, uh, you know, also putting it. And I think at least at Lemnisk, uh, we've always been attempting to do that for sure, right? Uh, one other point, uh, you know, in fact, we heard Miko talk earlier uh, about, and in one of the things he spoke of was, uh, you know, sort of all, have a always in beta kind of experimental mindset, right? Uh, and, you know, I've heard you in the past also uh, asking the team to think big, swing big. Um, and so as a leader, as a MarTech leader, how do you encourage uh, a culture of experimentation? Because it also often brings with it the, the need to sort of develop uh, a higher tolerance for failure. So how do you sort of b balance these two out? Look, the, the first, I tend to believe that it's a failure only if you fail to learn. Because if you learned something in the process, then it wasn't a failure. You got your money's worth, right? Now, in my belief, uh, in the world we live in today, Subra, the cost of inaction way trumps the cost of failure. Completely. Okay. The, a mistake can be rectified. If you did nothing, you will be extinct and you deserve to be extinct, right? So in that process, we believe that we have to, and, and all of us in different ways are leaders at the same time. We, we may be leading broader agendas or smaller agendas, but we have to embrace and celebrate the concept of learning. Now, this is where people like Miko got into this journey you know, they they embraced it. They were comfortable that mistakes will be made along the way, and they're okay with it. And and that's how it has to work. You know, when I used to run direct marketing departments, I used to tell my uh, creative directors that if some packages do not fail in A/B testing, it worries me a lot because that suggests that we didn't push our thinking far enough. If everything is working. That means we have been working with the sure shot bets. But the problem with sure shot bets is they give you 5%, 6%, 8%, 10% lifts. They don't give you 150% lifts. So if you want to unlock the next big value pool, you have to be prepared to swing for the fences. And every time you swing, you will not connect with the ball. Right? So we have to be prepared to absorb that as part and parcel of the way. I think... Uh, a culture of experimentation requires a culture of celebrating the learning that you get along the way. If you have a boss at Unilever who's just said that don't make the exact same mistake twice, but as long as you're making mistakes, that's fine. That's the cost of learning. That's the cost of grooming you to run these big broad agendas. 
and i think in that process as miko uh, alluded in his constant beta mode i think you have to do constant iteration so don't get stuck there start with a hypothesis build from there doesn't work course correct and move on and you, you've been a part of this uh, as well and in fact uh, let me bring in that element of the culture of uh, of experimentation to me is a very big item on how i determine which partner to work with uh, and and let me connect the two dots for you because they're a little bit strange to me the choice of partner is a little bit determined more by the softer side of it okay because let's face it an awesome solution averagely implemented will give me a much lower return than an average solution awesomely implemented so i look for people who do the leaders of those solution providers get it do they understand what they are in the business of doing if you are selling me a solution per se i'm suspicious i need to understand do you understand what are you trying to do for the customer how do you see your solution driving that new generation of marketing how will it make the consumer's job easier how will it empower them now if you get that then we go on to determining uh, what is your mechanism of onboarding getting started and educating us because if you are going to do that right frankly my risk of failure actually goes down or or rather it right shifts i'll still have some failures but i'll have failures on things that i should have had failures on if my big failures were because i didn't onboard right that's that's not called a failure that's called stupidity on my part so so we have to get partners who get that and who are very committed to that right because you, you can't see yourself as the guy who has to sell the solution you have to see yourself as the guy who's going to make me successful right in that process and you know i am going to just uh, call out an example of yourself you have attended every one of the discussions we've had where we've looked at the use cases we've looked at what worked what didn't work what have we learned how are we course correcting uh, what what are we going to do differently going out of that room now honestly as a solution designer as a solution owner as a ceo of the company you don't need to do that but the fact that you do is what gives us the comfort that you understand this culture of experimentation and that you are as committed as we are to learning from it right so that's how we see this it's a partnership none of these things ever happen in isolation we all band together and then we figure out how to make the magic happen no no thank thanks a lot and i think uh, as i said for me also it's not just about uh, you as a customer or anybody as a customer i, I guess it's more about passion and just the ability to make people successful with something that you're building and i think that just makes it so easy to uh, to do many of these things that you referred to uh, but really very very kind of you to uh, sort of point that out as well thank you uh, one last thing i think we are obviously headed out of the pandemic uh, so as you look at 2021 and maybe a little beyond uh, so sort of what's going through your mind you know what are you planning uh, and you know uh, what are your thoughts of uh, as we come out of covid so okay, guy i'm very grateful that the world has learned a level of resilience and empathy that i i think even we did not expect to have i think frankly our children have demonstrated a level of resilience that has been uh, delightful to watch they have retooled you know for kids who used to spend uh, the bulk of their evenings downstairs hanging out with their friends in the open to be locked down for months on end and they have adapted and i think that mechanism of adapt and continue to grow is, is something that i have uh, i feel privileged to have seen in action throughout the last one year and my hope is that truly the pandemic is on the way down and that all of us as organizations will stick with the things that we have learned to do better and the way we have learned to serve our customers better that we'll build upon those i think there's a ton of opportunity there is a ton of uh, necessity to work with partners like you guys who are bringing in solutions that sounded very advanced a year and a half ago but now are sounding like table stakes right we have to have those things in the absence of those things we can't function as an effective business i've had to take a million people off the street right now 
if we don't fill that vacuum with substantially solid digital technological solutions we we cannot sustain our business let alone grow it right so i i think it's it's with a lot of uh, humility i i have been amazed at my team uh, they have just uh, done such a fabulous fabulous job and continue to do a fabulous job because everyone i think in a weird way the pandemic has brought out the best in uh, everyone as a professional mm-hmm. that i engage with and they are pushing not just themselves they're pushing our collective thinking they're pushing my thinking and and that's exactly what we need they're pushing your thinking i i know the half the things we keep asking you guys to deliver and you're going well we hadn't thought of that but why not right no i think I, the pandemic did i think on balance uh, uh, bring out the best in in most folks right so yeah so prashant thank you so much uh, as always it was uh, it was incredible uh, speaking to you thank you very very much for your uh, time uh, pleasure to brian uh, thank you to you and your team you've been very valued partners for us and will continue to be so and uh, i'm sure miko is going to build something very magical with uh, your team together and we are going to take that magic and replicate it in a bunch of places but uh, i really appreciate the kind of partnership that you guys have shown and uh, you know for everyone i'd say don't work with vendors guys life is too short to work with vendors work with partners so he subra will remember that from the first conversation we ever had where i told him that i never work with a vendor it's not a good use of our time we only work with partners so the passion is what tips the the balance and then we build upon that and i think it's serving us really well wonderful thank you thank you very much and on that note as perfect note to sort of uh, end uh, both this session and uh, this sort of summit so with that uh, ladies and gentlemen we sort of come to the end uh, of the event today uh, i hope you all can carry away nuggets of insights from today's session i had a great time sort of moderating some of these sessions a uh, couple of quick administrative points before we close uh, this is the first of three summits we're holding the middle east and north africa event is scheduled on the 18th of feb Uh, and the india event is scheduled on the 26th uh, registrations are open for both and we have a stellar set of speakers there as well so if you or any of your acquaintances are interested please do ask them to register um i also want to let everyone know that uh, the sessions today uh, have been recorded and will be available on demand after the event so please watch out uh, for the lemnisk uh, social channels and website where we'll sort of be sharing this you should also get an email Uh, once again thank you so much for everyone's time thank you once again prashant and everybody that uh, sort of participated in the event today uh, have a great evening and stay safe thanks bye